Good morning and welcome to Mount Strum Baptist Church. Please stand as we sing This Is Our God. Remember those walls that we caught sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. Those walls are rubble now. Remember those giants we caught death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way, but he came and he died and he rose. Those giants are dead now. And this is our God, this is who he is, he loves us. This is our God, this is what he does, he saves us. Born the cross. Remember that fear that took our breath away. Faith so weak that we could barely pray. But he heard every word, every whisper. Now those altars in the wilderness tell the story of his faithfulness. Never once. Did he fail? No, he never will. This is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. Born the cross, he beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. Nobody but Jesus Who rescued me from that grave Yahweh, Yahweh Who gets the glory and praise Nobody but Jesus Who rescued me from that grave Yahweh, Yahweh Who gets the glory and praise Nobody but Jesus Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise? Nobody but Him. This is our God. This is who He is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what He does. He saves us. He bore the cross. He beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God. Jesus. He bore the cross, he beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim this is our God, King Jesus. Oh, this is our God. nothing new how could I express all my gratitude I could sing these songs as I often do but 
every song must end, and you never do. So I'll throw on my hands, I praise you again and again, cause all that I have is a you get shy on me, lift up your song, cause you got a lion inside of those lungs, get up and praise the Lord, so come on my soul, oh don't you get shy on me, lift up your song, cause you got a lion inside of those lungs, get up and praise my soul oh don't you get shy on me lift up your song cause you got a lion inside of those lungs get up and praise the Lord so I throw up my hands I praise you again and again cause all that I have is a
We thank you for this day. We thank you for the sacrifice you made for us on the cross and that you fulfilled your promise to us and that you defeated death, you defeated the grave so that we can live eternal life with you if we choose to accept that. Open our hearts and our minds this morning as we dive into your word and learn more about you and that we take something to heart this morning. Amen.
Welcome this morning. If you would join me in turning to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Today we're continuing our new series on the book of Acts. And remember we're studying this book as soldiers with a purpose. We're not just remembering what God did and thinking, well, that was great then. We are looking what God did then and believing that God can still do it in our lifetime. Remember, we're giving God a blank check saying, God, whatever you have for me in this new year, I'm willing to do. I want to do it because it's your will. And please pray as we continue to pursue the mission and the vision of our church here at Mounts Run. We want to continue growing in Christ. We want to go into all the world with God's love, teaching God's word and making disciples all for the glory of God. We want to do that here at Mount Run. Now, as we think about this and as we turn our eyes now to chapter 1 and verse 12, we want to think about decisions that we make in our life. Uh, we make decisions every day. Is it time to find a new job? Should we adopt? What college or graduate school should I attend? Should I continue binge watching or is it time to go to bed, right? We make that decision. Is this the person I'm supposed to marry? Is it time for us to move? Is it time for me to sell my house? All these decisions that we make and many more. How awesome would it be to know the will of God when it comes to each and every one of those decisions? I think most of us make discovering God's will way more complicated than it really is. This morning we're continuing our study in the book of Acts and we're going to see a beautiful model for how we as believers should make decisions. See, we serve a good God. Do you believe that? We serve an awesome God. He wants us to know his will because he wants what's best for us. God's not like the teacher that you had in school who would purposely jumble all the words in the true or false section of the test just to mess with you, right? Just to trick you. Sorry, teachers that are in here. He's not like that. God is a good God, and we serve a wonderful God. Now, really quick, before we get started, remember how we ended last week. Jesus had spoken to them. Jesus ascended. The angel said, do what he told you to do. Don't stand there watching up in the sky, but what did he tell them to do? Look at Acts 1, verse 8 again with me. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. I've got a mission for you. Something that's going to be huge. You're going to be my witnesses. You're going to be witnesses of me in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Wow, we're excited. This sounds great. You're going to do all that. You're going to tell everyone who I am, but first... You need to wait. Verse 4 says this, wait for the promise of the Father. Now that word is no fun. How many of you absolutely, you cannot wait to wait in here? Anybody in here? I love waiting. It's the best thing. There are rooms dedicated to this horrible word, right? Whether you're at the doctor or you're getting your car repaired or getting a haircut or you're getting your taxes done, guess what? All of these have a common denominator, and that is waiting rooms. We don't enjoy waiting. Waiting is hard. If you're a college student, waiting is hard. If you're single, waiting is hard. If you're engaged, waiting is hard. If you've applied for a job, waiting is hard. On and on and on, it's very difficult to do what? To wait. Jesus gives them this purpose of their existence. You're going to go glorify me by being my witnesses to all the world. But first, wait. Because I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit that he will empower you. So they have to do what? They have to wait. And this is the state of the early church as we jump into verse 12. Let's start with a word of prayer. God, we come to you. Thanking you for this day. Thank you for this, the people that are here today, Lord. The songs we were able to sing about you, Lord. But God, as we get our minds right right now, as we begin to remove all distractions, we begin to focus on you and your word today. God, help me as the, the preacher, as the pastor, to not be a distraction. Help me to preach your word the way that you wrote it. 
the way that we need to hear it, the way we need to apply it. God, help us to put out the things that we think or want or any of those things about the church right now and focus solely on you. God, as we open up your word, let it become alive to us. Each and every week we ask that, Lord, that we don't just come here as a formality. We don't just come here just to sing some songs, listen to somebody get up and preach, and just leave the same. God, do something in our lives. Change us. Help us today as we're looking at your will for our lives. God, that we would genuinely seek it. Some of us in here, we're stuck in our ways. We've been doing the same thing. This is what my life has become, and maybe you want to shake that up a little bit. Maybe you want to change some things in our life. Maybe you want us to get involved in the church in a different way. Or maybe you want us to make a big decision that we've been holding out on. But God, I pray that you would do something in our lives that we would be willing to accept that. Because your will is the best way. And it's the only way, to be honest. So God, I pray that you would help us to get something from your word today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So you're looking at Acts chapter 1. Let's start at verse 12. It says, then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. See, they obeyed the Lord's command. They returned to Jerusalem. And it says, with great joy, they were very excited. Look at Luke chapter 24. It'll be up on the screen for you, verses 52 and 53. This is Luke's other account. Remember, he's written both of these, and he's going back and forth a little bit. But let's look at what he says here. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with what? Great joy. And were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. And he says, Amen. Can you imagine this walk? Again, after you've seen something, after something has happened that was big in your life, something was amazing, you saw something happen, and all of a sudden it's now time to leave. It's time to go home. It's time to go back to normal life, and you just can't stop. Your your heart is still pounding from whatever it was that happened, whatever that amazing thing was. And as you're walking home, I can't imagine what it was like for these people. Can you imagine this walk as they're walking back? It's about a third of a mile, which was the length that you were allowed to walk on the Sabbath, which it says there in the Word of God. But you're, you're remembering what just happened. They just saw Jesus as he ascended into heaven. And again, this is old news to us. We heard these stories. We've seen helicopters and planes and things that go up in the sky and balloons. As you remember last week, this is all new to them. A person, Jesus Christ, just ascended into heaven. The angel told them to stop looking up and get going and Maybe as they're walking, they they just couldn't stop talking. Maybe they couldn't be quiet, or maybe some of them, they just couldn't speak at all. They're walking and just thinking and then just pondering what had just happened. Maybe some of them were pinching themselves. Was that a dream? What in the world? I saw a man go up into the sky. What's happening here? But we definitely get this idea and this sense that there's hopeful expectation. Something big is about to happen. Look at verse 13 now. The beginning of verse 13 says this, And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room. Many scholars believe that this was the same upper room where the Last Supper took place. It must have been a very large room because we'll find out later that 120 people squeezed into this room. And think about the variety of all these people that made up this first assembly of believers here. There were men and there were women. There were apostles and there were ordinary people in there. And there were even members of the Lord's earthly family. We'll see that in a second as well. Look at Acts thirteen or 1 verse 13 again here and finish up this verse. It says, Where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the Lotus, and Judas the brother of James, the eleven remaining apostles am i the only one that kind of feels bad for this other guy at the end of this verse whose name is judas as well i wonder if he immediately wanted to change his name after what happened with judas iscariot he's like wait a minute i don't like my name anymore right this is not a good name to have you know there were more than one disciple that was named judas and there's that judas and then there's this judas right 
aren't you bummed if your name is Judas now? In those days, anybody that was named Judas is like, man, can I change my name? I'm going to go change it right now. People are like, oh, who are you? What's your name? You know, uh, well, I'm one of Jesus' disciples. Uh, I'm one of his apostles. And they say, well, what's your name? Well, my name is Judas. Oh, wait a minute. Didn't you die? No, I'm not that one, right? I'm not that one. I'm the other Judas. And so he would begin to, to walk around and he'd have the name tag on there that said the other Judas, right? So people would recognize him. I'm not that Judas. I'm the other one, right? I'm different. But his name tag or his name was Judas, the brother of James. Continue reading here in verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. If you underline things in your Bible, underline that. Those two words, one accord, and underline prayer and supplication. It says, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. We see here that Jesus had a following that went beyond these 11 apostles. Luke tells us that they were all joined together in prayer, and what a beautiful picture. Again, to be a fly on the wall in this moment as you see them coming together in one accord in prayer. And Luke will develop the importance of prayer throughout the, the book of Acts, but I love that Luke includes Jesus' his own family is here in this moment. Uh, do you find it fascinating that Jesus, is, his own brothers and his own sisters were convinced that finally they were convinced that Jesus was who he said he was? Can you imagine making this claim to your siblings? Again, Jesus, he was born of God, but yet he lived a normal life. He had brothers and, and he had sisters. And to make this claim that I am the son of God. I can't imagine myself saying that to my brother and my sister. I'm the son of God. Uh, okay, James, right. It kind of reminds me of Joseph, right? How many of you in here are the oldest sibling? You are the oldest sibling in here. Raise your hand, okay? I'm about to pick on you, okay? How many of you in here are the younger sibling? You're not the youngest, but you're somewhere in the middle. Can you imagine your older brother coming to you and saying, I am the son of God? You're like, no. Not true, right? Definitely not happening, right? I can picture you being Satan, but not the Son of God, right? There's a huge difference. I know you. I've lived with you. I know how you act. Can you imagine, Cameron, can you imagine Brady coming to you and saying, I'm the Son of God? What would your response be? Don't say it. Never mind. Let's move on, okay? But that's what happened here. His own brothers and his own sisters were part of this. The Son of God. The accounts in Matthew 13 and in Mark 6 tell us that Jesus could not do mighty works in his own city because of their unbelief. He was not welcome there. And at one point, Jesus' brothers and sisters, they did not believe. But now we see that his family truly believes. What would it take you to convince your own siblings that you are the son of God? Nothing short of resurrection from the dead. And guess what? That's what Jesus did. And all of a sudden, they're going, wow. He is truly who he says he is. I understand now. Don't lose sight of this, though. Going back to the verse here. The Bible says they were in one accord, meaning they were unified. And I want you to get the picture of what's going on here because we have followers here. I've been following Jesus. I've been with him. They could have shown pride. I've been along for the ride. I've been part of what's going on here. They could have had pride in their life. We have apostles here. We're the called. We're the chosen ones. They could have had pride in their life. We have Jesus' own family. Guess what? I'm getting a front seat here because, hey, 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 I'm brother of Jesus. I'm the sister of Jesus. I get to go up front. We could have had pride happening here. And it very well could have happened anywhere within any of these people here. Yet they put all that aside for the cause of Christ. To be unified in prayer. What a beautiful picture of the church here that we see here. You see, the place that you grew up doesn't matter. The money that you make, it doesn't matter. The age that you got saved, it doesn't matter. You see, we are all one in Jesus Christ. And as one, we make up the church. And we see that picture here as they are in one accord together. They are unified for the cause of Christ. To be the church we need to be, Christ must be the center. But we also need to have faith and trust in one another. 
Not one person in the church should think of themselves better than the other person. Well, I do this. I'm a teacher, so the janitor is a little bit less than me. I scrape the snow outside, uh, but you're much higher than me because you go up there and preach, or you go up there and sing, or you do this, and we start to bicker and do that kind of... No, we don't see that here. And it shouldn't be that way in the church. Philippians 2, 3 says, let nothing... How much, church? Hmm. Let what, church? Nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem who? Let each esteem who? Other. Better than themselves. We lift one another up. When you're down, I lift you up. I don't look down on you because of a different office in the church or a different thing that you do in the church. I lift you up. I'm there for you. I help you. Now look at verse 15. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples, and he said the number of names together were about 120. That's where we get the 120 there. Verse 16. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus, for he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. We see here that every decision was bathed in prayer. The early church, they knew how to pray. They knew the power of prayer. I like this quote here. It says, Prayer is both the thermometer and the thermostat of the local church. For the spiritual temperature either goes up or down depending on how God's people pray. Isn't that true? If we're going to be a church that succeeds, we've got to be a church that prays. That a priority is put on prayer because there is power in prayer. Now we don't know if this was planned or if Peter was prompted by the Holy Spirit, but Peter stands up. And he says, we need to replace Judas. This is the first church meeting here that was going on here. We need to replace this guy, Judas. The guy who betrayed Jesus. The guy who committed suicide. And he tells them about what had happened. If you hadn't heard about Judas, well, let me tell you. Look at verse 18. Now this man purchased a field with the rewards of iniquity or sin. And falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. What a beautiful thing to be talking about on a Sunday morning. Amen, right? All his bowels gushed out. Verse 19, and it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, in so much as that field is called in their proper tongue, Ekeldama, that is to say, the field of blood. Matthew tells us in his gospel that Judas had committed suicide. We can combine the data uh, that is given to us from Luke and from Matthew and guess that Judas, he probably hung himself. Either the rope broke and his body fell upon the rocks that, and disemboweled him or he simply hung there until his body was decomposed. Definitely gross, I know. Then in verse 20, Peter, he quotes Psalms. And I love this. Again, how cohesive the Bible is, how it works together. Psalm 69, verse 25, and Psalms 109, verse 8. Those are the things that he, he speaks on here, and he quotes those. And you know what? When it's time to make a decision, we must look to the Word of God. And this is what Peter stood up and said. He did not stand up and say, hey, guess what I think? Guess what I know? Guess what I view this as? No, he said, this is what the Word of God says. And look at verse 20 now. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. They have a crisis here. Leadership transitions in ministry, they're always hard, and this one was especially difficult. Knowing what had happened with Judas here, knowing the sin that was involved, and, and all the things that went on here, and you know, knowing that Jesus, he picked 12 guys. One of them betrayed him, one of them was complicit in his murder, and his name was Judas Iscariot. He went out and he killed himself. Somebody needs to say something. They've walked in this room, they're praying, and, and now it's time for somebody to say something. Who's going to say something? And that someone is Peter. Peter is the human leader that Jesus had placed in charge. I can't help but pause and think about who this was that Jesus had said about this. He said, that thou art Peter. And upon a rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 
And here we are again, we have to apply our human self, our human thinking, the way that we think here and now, we think that guy, if I'm reading the Bible, I'm looking through the people that should have been the leader in this moment, I'm looking at Peter and I'm saying, that guy is the one that's going to be the corner of the church. That is what the church is going to be built on. The guy who is, he's just a fisherman, didn't go to college, didn't go to Bible college, didn't study and all those things. He's just a fisherman, just a common man, right? The guy who lost sight of Jesus as he's walking on the water. What an amazing story. Jesus is there walking on the water and he calls for Peter. And Peter gets on the water and all of a sudden he starts looking around. And he sees the waves and he hears the wind and the rain and then he begins to sink. Jesus lifts him up. That guy, the one that didn't have enough faith to walk on water, what in the world? The guy who was a hothead, how many times did Peter lose his temper? How many in here have a temper? No, don't raise your hand, okay? That hothead, that's the one. The guy who cussed. This is the guy who cursed follower of Jesus, uh, one that was with Jesus all the time, and yet he, he was a cusser. He cussed many times. He would curse. How many of you in here? Kurt, no, don't say that again, okay? We'll keep our hands down. This is the guy, the guy who was a hothead, the guy who had a temper, the guy who cussed, the guy who literally took a sword and cut somebody's ear off. That guy? This is the one we're talking about? The guy who denied Jesus not once, not twice? Three times? This is the guy that we're talking about? That guy? Who not only denied but got mad that someone would consider him as part of Jesus, his family there, his people there. That guy? Just think about this. And couldn't it be said of me? Each one of us in here, as we walk in here, we've got to be honest and humble before God and say, God, thank you. Thank you for choosing me. Thank you for allowing me to serve you. Thank you for allowing me to do your will. Thank God that he called someone as inadequate as me with all my flaws and with all my failures. And Jesus saw potential in me. And all of us in here can say the same thing. Thank you, God, for allowing me to serve you in this place. But we see Peter, he stepped up. Peter, he's going to lead the people The question is, how is this leader going to lead? This is very important, and this is very critical. What we see here is he's going to lead them by following Scripture. You see, leaders, good leaders, they follow Scripture. Godly leaders, they follow God's Word. People may have some good ideas, but ultimately everything rises and falls with us coming back to the Bible and saying, what has God said? They start with prayer then they move on to scripture. Prayer is how we talk to God and scripture is how God talks to us. So in prayer, we're talking to God and he uses prayer to change us. And then as we open up the scripture, we're submitting ourselves to his authority in God's word. So that then we might know how to work out what God's will is in our life. This is what Peter did as he stands up and he says, I'm going to lead. I'm going to lead by using God's word right away. Now look at verse 21. Wherefore, these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. They've been with us. It says, beginning from the baptism of John, under that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. See, what they wanted to do here is they wanted to align themselves with God's choice. Not prove to God, this is who we think should be the candidate. This is who we think should be the one. The criteria is now set in place for, his, for Judas's replacement. It needs to be a man who is an eyewitness of all the accounts of what Jesus had done. Christianity is founded on the historical resurrection, and those who first proclaimed the resurrection had to be trustworthy, and they had to be informed. Look now at verse 23. And they appointed two. Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. They're now down to two candidates. So they have a leadership change happening here. They have their criteria. Then they pick their candidates. Here we have Joseph and we have Matthias. And then they've got to make their choice. But do they vote? No, we don't see that. They let God vote. 
And they do it through the casting of lots. Look now at verse 24. And they prayed and said, Thou Lord, what's that word again? And they prayed and said, Thou Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Now this seems a little odd, doesn't it? And this is where I started out in week one talking about this, the fact that we don't do this anymore, okay? We don't see this as a casino, okay? That's the way some people read into this. Oh, this sounds good. This is a casino kind of atmosphere here. It's not Peter saying, all right, he's shaking the dice here, and he says, all right, give me an apostle, give me an apostle, whoom, and he shakes it and throws the dice down. That's not what what's happening here. It's not like that. They, they're not just rolling dice. The casting of lots, it was a common thing within Israel. That's why it says in Proverbs 16, it says it this way, the lot is cast, listen to this, into the lap. But this is extremely important here, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. It should be noted also that this is the last scriptural case where they use casting of lots to make a decision. You see, we don't need dice to be rolled. We don't need cast, uh, to cast the lots or anything like that anymore because we have the Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit of God within us. Who picked Matthias? Jesus picked Matthias. And he joins the 12. The team is now complete. And what's interesting about Matthias is that he's not a very prominent guy here. Uh, he doesn't write a book in the Bible. We don't know a whole lot about this person. He's just a humble guy that serves and he's part of the team. Church history tells us that maybe he became an apostle or a missionary there in Ethiopia. So very interesting that this is the guy that's added on here. So now everything is set for the coming of the Holy Spirit. What we talked about as they're waiting for the Holy Spirit to come down to empower them, everything is set for the sending of the church into the whole world. So how do we know that we're following the will of God? This is what we began talking about here, and this is how we're going to end. How do we know that we're following God's will? How do we discern God's will in our life? The primary reason this is in the Bible is not simply to help us discover God's will for our own life, understand that. That would be bad hermeneutics if I were to say it that way. But ultimately, this passage, it informs us how God's sovereignty worked to advance his mission and his purpose. I think, though, that we can make an application when it comes to this idea of decision-making as followers of Jesus Christ. So listen with me as we close with this. I believe every decision that a Christian makes matters. Do you believe that? I believe that everything that we do on this earth, it matters. When it comes to decision making, it's important for us as believers to understand the difference between God's revealed will and his yet to be revealed will. Part of God's will is written in black and white. It's right there in God's word. The believers here in Acts 1 knew part of God's will because they knew the scriptures. Look at this, number one, I want you to do this. Seek God's will in the pages of his word. In the pages of his word. Because of this, there are some things that we don't have to question. We don't have to wonder whether we should be making disciples. Should I be making disciples? Should I be discipling others? We don't have to wonder that. We don't have to wonder, do I have to pray? Should I be praying? We don't have to wonder, do I need to live a holy life? We don't need to know, should I bear fruit or not? Should I love people? Should I be faithful in my marriage? And should I care for others? We don't have to know whether that's true or not, or wonder whether that's true or not, because that is in God's holy word. It has been revealed to us. Those things are part of God's revealed will, the Bible. We don't have to seek counsel on that. Becca, I need to counsel with you because I need to know whether I should love Pam or not. I'm struggling and I need to know, is this God's will for my life that I love her the way that I should? Is that, is that true? Should I counsel on that? No, we don't need counseling for that because it's plainly written to love your neighbor as yourself. I should love those that, that are around me. So we have this in plain black and white. We know what the Bible says and many times we make it more complicated than it should be. What is written in God's word is truth. And what people are doing now is they're taking it and they're ripping it out and saying, I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know if that's true or not. And then we complicate it. Should I do these things? Should I be a disciple of God? Should I love others? 
No, it's written right there in God's word. Those are things that we should be doing. It is truth because it's there in black and white. We also know that we shouldn't be lazy. We're supposed to work hard, but we don't, don't always know exactly what job we're supposed to take or, or where we're supposed to live or what degree we should pursue. Those things are things that we're seeking God and asking God for his will because that is not plain black and white in Scripture. So where do we start when we're asking God? When we're trying to make a decision, we start with Scripture. Why should God tell us where to go to college or who we're supposed to marry or or what job we're supposed to take if we're not even doing the things that God has called us to do? If we're not living the way that God has called us to live, then no wonder we're struggling with all these other decisions. See, the believers in Acts 1, verses 12 through 26, they demonstrated a confidence in and an allegiance to the scriptures. They based every decision off prayer and scripture. So number one, we're seeking God's will in the pages of his word. And number two, we're trusting his word as our authority. Again, we live in a day and age where people don't take God's word as, as authority. But we, like the first believers, we can and should trust the scriptures to direct our path in our life. The Bible is objective, while our senses, our feelings, they can be subjective. We can sway, we can move along with what sounds good, or who's preaching what, or who's saying what. If it's not according to God's word, we can be swayed with those things. But the word of God, it must be our guide And I hope this hits hard today. I hope you get that, that we start with the scripture. Start with the revealed will of God. Trust the Bible as our authority. And then here's number three. It's a very easy outline today. Continue each and every day with that in mind. We take God's word every single day. As we make decisions, should I do this today? Should I make this decision? What does the Bible say? And if I'm doing what God has called me to do, then I trust in his word, I trust in his authority, and I continue in those things each and every day following God's will in my life. There's some practical steps that we can take away from this passage when it comes to making decisions. In verse 23, we clearly see that the 11 apostles, they did their homework. They didn't just come and just make a decision. No, they did their homework on potential candidates to replace Judas. And they put forth two men that were going to be given the qualifications here. And in discerning God's will on specifics, we should be doing our homework when it comes to those things. Gathering information and then taking it to God. Praying and asking God, God, is this what I should be doing? God, is this your will in my life? You say, I'm already set in my ways. I'm already doing what I'm doing. And so I know what's going on. But maybe God has something planned for you in this new year that's going to take you a little bit off that path. Take you a little step away from what you find comfortable, what you've been doing over and over again. And maybe God wants to do something special in your life in this year. Again, I refer to the blank check. And this is the question that we have to ask ourselves. Are we willing to say, God, I want your will over my will. God, I want what you want over what I want. I have a nice, cushy job. Everything's going fine. My family's fine. Everything's going great. I don't want to know God's will because it might change things in my life. I'm living the way I'm living. I got a job that I got that I enjoy, and I'm living this way. I don't know if I want to know that. But the best way is God's way, and that's discerning God's will. And we take that by prayer. We take that by reading God's word and trusting in him and asking him for for our decisions every single day of our life. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and close our eyes. And I want us to really focus in on this today. Some of you in here might, like I said, be setting your way. Some of you in here, you might be struggling. God, I'm trying to figure out what you want me to do in my life. I'm trying to discern your will. As we take from God's word here today in Acts and we see what the the men did here, how they made decisions here, we need to apply those to ourselves today. Every single decision needs to be bathed in prayer. Every single decision that we make needs to be aligned with God's word. And as we take each step by faith, step, 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 trusting God each step of the way, God will reveal what he wants us to do in our lives, but it needs to align with him. And I promise you, it will be 
the best way. Let's pray. Dear Lord, God, I pray as we've seen some very valuable things in here that we can apply to our lives. There are things that we can praise you about. The fact that we see that Peter, who was chosen, he was a common man, and yet you used him for great things. The fact that we see the way they made decisions, the way they sought your will, we can apply that to our life. Now, God, I pray that each one of us in here, in this moment, we would not block you out. We would not say, I don't really want to know. But, God, I pray that in this moment, we will come to you with open hands and open hearts. God, am I following your will now? Am I doing what you want me to do in this moment? Or is there more that I could do? Is there something different I could do? God, our church is only going to thrive and survive if we're following your will as a church, if we're following your will as individuals. And God, I pray that we would align our hearts with you. Be with us today, God, as, as we finish up. Be, keep us safe on our ways. But as we leave this place, Lord, I pray that our heart, our motive would be to serve you and to align with you in what you have called us to do. We love you, we praise you, we thank you for all that you do in our lives and, and the love that you've shown us, the kindness you've shown us, the grace and the mercy that you've shown us, but help us to align ourselves today. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand with me? We're gonna sing a song to close out. And as always, this is decision time. This is the time where you either say, no thanks God, or you say, God, I want to do something for you. I wanna change. I want to know what you have for me. So as we sing this song, would you make these decisions in your heart? Would you pray to God and have an open, honest conversation with him? Let's sing. Perfect in power.